Hello and welcome to CG Visuals, my name is Zach, and today we'll be taking a look at the spell presets included in Trap Code Magic. We'll be covering how to composite these effects into your live action plates and how to optimize them for the best speed. So in the Trap Code Magic folder we have our assets and our pre-rendered elements. Some of the projects include some optional pre-rendered elements that you can enable just to get a head start. Even though all of the projects are dynamic simulations, we have the overview video that's included that gives you a great uh, overview of the project. And we also have Trap Code Particular 5 and version 4.1.5 compatibility. And I'm using Trap Code Particular 5.0.3, which I have installed as you can see in the Red Giant Application Manager. So that's the version that I'll be using. <clears throat> so if we take a look at the uh, charms and categories that we have, uh, we'll be taking a look at the stunning charms here. So we'll open up this folder. As you can see, we have some different spells for After Effects CC 2020 and 2018. We have the quintessential spell used by the good guys, Stupefy, but we're going to start with a more simpler spell that the first years learn called Flipendo, which is one of my favourite spells from one of the original Harry Potter games for the PlayStation. So in After Effects, we'll make sure we're in the correct version and we'll open up the Flipendo charm. And as you can see, we have the same clean user interface that you're used to. We'll start this uh, pre-render here, uh, caching in the effect. And this actually includes the projectile and also a spell impact. So it's kind of like two simulations. So we'll see that in a moment. Uh, we have the compositing options, which are always highlighted in green in the export comp. As you can see, we have some basic tools to help uh, composite the effect like we have the uh, color controls and everything and um, this is the spell impact but uh, if you had a caster who was deflecting a shield we also have these uh, shield charms as well so we could use the protego deflection spell which is kind of inspired from the effect from fantastic beasts you can also see we have the larger version as well you'll sometimes see a maxima version of the spells Continuing to have a look here, we have Expelliarmus and the Disarming Charms. We have the Death Eater Smoke, which is a really cool fluid simulation. We have the Exploding Charms here, Bombarder. So we have, this is separated into three elements. We've got the Projectile, the Wand Flash, and also a Debris Impact as well. So you can create all sorts of uh, combinations of those effects as well. So we'll be having a look at the rest of these effects in the later videos. Uh, so we'll definitely have a look at those. Uh, we also have the Incendio Charm, that's the one that Professor McGonagall uses in her duel against Snape. Uh, so that was a requested effect. And um, in that duel, uh, Snape is using the uh, deflection shield charm there so you can mix and match these effects and uh, that's something that we'll be taking a look at. Uh, we also have the Patronus charms as well so we have Expecto Patronum, uh, the Maxima version of the Expanding Orb and also the Pyro, uh, Pyro Incantatum Jewel as well, the one with the green and red lightning so that's a more uh, advanced effect that we'll work our way up to but uh, let's have a look at this pre-render here so you can see how um, easy this would be to use in a duel. You've got the casting and the impact. And um, so it's all well and good uh, just rendering the preview that we've got here to have a look but we actually want to be able to customize these spells and also be able to work with them very quickly as well because uh, there is quite a lot going on. So in order to do that, we'll go into the Particles comp. Every project is uh, organized into an export and a Particles comp. The green layers are the ones that allow you to 
control the spell, like the projectile locator. We obviously have a camera. You can bring in your own uh, 3D tracked camera as well. If we were just rendering this as an asset, we could, uh, you know, rotate the camera around to get the type of custom spell we want. But uh, if you were to bring in a tracked 3D camera, which is what we'll do later in the tutorial, we'd actually want to be able to uh, customize and change the path of this effect. Um, so if we press U on the casting controls here, we have some uh, keyframes uh, for things like the emission rate, the impact emission rate, and it's all named very uh, self-explanatory. These are basically the, the most useful uh, effects that you'd want to have access to uh, globally without actually going into particular. Uh, for example, we can change the velocity from motion and that will actually change the physics of the spell to more of a longer trail. And you can see at this stage when we're trying to uh, change settings and stuff, we are having to wait a little while to see those changes updated. But what we're going to do is basically uh, demonstrate how to uh, isolate the spell and be able to work with it much more quickly. And the way I always do this when I'm starting a, uh, a shot is I unhide the layers so I can see the uh, hidden layers. The ones highlighted in red are the simulations, so you know which ones are uh, responsible for the particle simulations. And if we just want to focus on the projectile, we could either solo that layer or we can just hide the rest of the layers. So now, instead of trying to calculate the impact, we're just going to be looking at the projectile, which is very useful because sometimes the projectile itself might have different layers for things like the sparks. And in Trap Code Particular 5, a very useful thing to do that I would recommend uh, doing by default whenever you want to change something is we don't need to see the 16 times uh, motion blur samples if we're just changing the simulation. And we can also change this particle amount, which is just how many particles will be visible. So this is like a global change that won't actually affect the physics or, the, or any of the keyframes. This is just like a rendering option. And also any uh, effects that are not necessary for the animation stage, like this refined soft matte edges effect. We can also disable that. And now we've, we've got the kind of interactivity that we want to be able to rapidly iterate and make changes. So as you can see, we can now rotate around this effect much more quickly. And what we're going to do is we'll customize the path and the impact of this effect. So for this demonstration, I'm going to imagine that maybe we have an actor on the left side of the screen, maybe a little bit further away. So I'm going to uh, press U on the projectile locator, get to the first keyframe and push that back in Z space and we'll kind of flip this uh, effect so that the spell is coming towards the camera. So we can just drag that over there and we uh, we have the interactivity that we need so that's very handy and we can also make like a custom uh, path for this and sometimes in After Effects when you make some changes they won't immediately update so that's why we have this recast particles seed. So if we change that value, uh, that will just force everything to... Uh, it will randomize the particles and also recache the simulation. So now those changes uh, will update. And also to make sure that the uh, animation makes sense on like an orthographic view, it's quite handy to switch to the top-down view just so that we can see what kind of a path that our animation is going to be taking. Then we can go back to the active camera. We also want our impact locator to be at the new uh, end point as well. So we'll do that in a moment. Um, as you can see, there's a wiggle expression on the projectile locator, so we can change that. And so what I'm going to do now is I think we'll. I want the impact to actually be in the frame. So I'm going to adjust the end point of the animation again since it doesn't take very long, and we'll get that to uh, an end point that we can actually see. So something like that. 
And if we come to our impact locator, we are going to, uh, we can actually rotate that as well because it says R to rotate impact. But first we're going to just copy the position keyframe from the projectile and paste that into the impact. And um, we can just make our own keyframe there. We just need it to carry on in the same direction. So rather than the impact being static, I normally add just a little bit of motion to it as well so that the impact will continue moving in the same direction as the, uh, as the path that we made. So we'll just uh, adjust this so that we have something that looks pretty decent. At this point, this is the uh, the rotation because the, the impact is like a, a ring. So you'd have to imagine it like it's an expanding ring. So by rotating this, the rotation of the impact is uh, connected to that impact locator. So simply by rotating that, we're also rotating the effect as well. So you can see it travels along the path, reaches the end point, and then the impact uh, continues forward for a little bit. And that'll just make the, the effect more interesting because it's like a fluid simulation. So it will it'll in inherit some of that velocity. And, and uh, I think we'll see when it all comes together that it looks very, uh, very fluid. So in order to visualize the impact particles, uh, we just want to get a very quick representation of what that's going to look like. So again, I'm going to go into the rendering tab, just reduce the visible particles and disable the motion blur. So this way we can now start scrubbing through our timeline and we can see the, uh, the results of what we just did there. So our projectiles heading towards the camera. It's a very sort of low quality visualization, but it's still enough to give you an idea. You can see that exploding kind of ring looks like it's going to envelop the camera, which is uh, you know, one of the immediate benefits that becomes apparent to using a 3D simulation is you, you can get those sort of effects. Rather than having an asset and, and simply enlarging the asset, we actually have particles that are going to go into the camera. So. Now that I'm ready to do a, a pre-render, I'm going to enable some of those more expensive effects like motion blur, put the particle count back to 100%, and I'll re-enable the rest of the layers, including those uh, light ray effects. The light rays are quite uh, interesting. They, they automatically follow the path of the spell as well. So, And then what we'll do is we'll just, at half res, we'll start a preview and we'll see what this looks like when it's finished. So we'll click play on this, took a couple of minutes and straight away we have a very um, unique effect. That extra wiggle that we put onto the uh, projectile is uh, really suiting that kind of fizzy, unpredictable, chaotic nature of the magic. It has this kind of interesting mix of like powder and sparks. We didn't want it to look like, you know, just sparks. We didn't want it to look like a firework. We kind of wanted, you know, something that really resembled the type of magic that you see in the film. So we're able to get some really nice uh, effects. So what we can do is just go back into the export comp and let's just have a look at how this is looking. And this is where we can now play around with the compositing effects. For example, the glow radius, it's quite a, uh, an easy effect to change. We can simply animate that so that the glow radius would increase over time. And this uh, explosion would become quite bright for a few frames and then it would fizzle out. We also have the environment lighting, which you, if you draw your eyes to the floor, you can see that there is some automatic uh, scene lighting. And by dragging this light distance, this actually moves the light um, along the floor uh, while keeping the kind of perspective uh, which is very useful because you can also animate that as well it saves a lot of time uh, pretty much use the inbuilt tools all the time we can change the color of this I had it set to an orange but we can go to like more of a red color which is quite satisfying kind of looks like maybe like confringo or uh, another spell so you can quite easily sort of make your own spells by changing the settings and uh, changing the color. 
And so that was using a particular version 5. It's also compatible for the uh, version 4 as well. So to show how easy it is to switch between versions, I just uninstalled particular from the Red Giant application manager. And you can download the uh, version 4 from either Red Giant or Maxon. They both offer the legacy versions. So I'm just going to download the installer, which I already have on my desktop as I switch between versions quite frequently when I'm uh, testing them. And I'll just run this installer, just select Particular. Takes about a, a minute or two to install. And then it's just a case of activating that. It'll reinitialize the Red Giant Application Manager. And now I've uh, just switched back to version 4.1.5 and uh, upgrading back to version 5 is simply just a, a case of clicking that blue upgrade button and then, um, then that automatically rolls you back to version 5. Uh, so if you're using uh, version 4, you want to um, you know, switch between versions, that's how easy it is to do it. So now that I've done that, I'm going to load After Effects back up. And this time I'm going to go into the version 4. And I'm going to uh, choose a different spell this time, a slightly more uh, advanced one called Expelliarmus. And although Spelliarmus usually doesn't have effects, if you cast a very powerful version of Expelliarmus, it can actually become like a forceful, kind of a stunning effect that actually knocks people back. So this is the more powerful version of Expelliarmus that you see Professor Snape casting in the films. And if we just uh, go back to the beginning here, we can see it starts with this interesting expanding fluid ring that has these uh, light rays that are coming out and I'm actually going to show you how to integrate this into a live action plate. So this uh, shot was filmed by my friend Jonathan Gallo uh, with with his drone there and this is his YouTube channel j, &J Studios and he's also on Instagram and he's the creator of at live action avatar which is the fan film that we're working on that was featured on the channel. So that has all sorts of interesting uh, visual effects, map paintings. It's also using our trap code elements, bending effects on the uh, film as well. So let's take a look at what is happening in this footage. We have a casting animation, then it looks like he does a flourish with the wand that I think will be perfect for like a, a shield spell. So we're going to we're going to have him casting a spell and then defending a spell. And I think those motions will work quite well. So before we can add any visual effects, we need to 3D track our shot. So I'm going to click on the camera tracker. And originally when I just left the default settings, it, it actually failed to get a track. So I had to put in a few custom values. Um, one of the first things I did in the 3D camera tracker is go to the advanced options and enable this detailed analysis. I reduced the target size which seemed to help get some more track points on the blades of grass there. And then I also decided to take a guess at the angle of view and because of this, this is a drone footage I just took a, an educated guess that this would be maybe 24 millimeter focal length as it's quite a wide looking shot. So uh, rather than leaving that up to After Effects, I decided to put those uh, those estimated uh, guesses in. And that uh, seemed to get a pretty decent result in a shot like this, something that we'll be able to use. As we see, there are plenty of points. Uh, we don't actually want the points on our actor because that can throw things off a bit. So one thing I did was just go through each frame and if ever any tracking points uh, started appearing on our actor. I just went through and removed those points. As we can see, it's just a case of deleting them. And so, uh, rather than showing this whole process, I just uh, I just did that off screen. But you get the idea. We just want the the environment without the actor being tracked. So now that we have our camera, we can just right click on a on an area of the ground which looks like it's going to give us a pretty decent um, floor plane here. It's right where our actor is and uh, the ring looks like it's the right size. So set ground plane and origin. And then 
going to try and select the same area that I selected. Then I'll go create solid and camera. And so this solid will be created right where our actor is. And it looks like it was a pretty successful track here. As we can see, it's uh, keeping the perspective shift of the of the camera as well. So it's quite a wide angle, but it looks like the, uh, the perspective um, stays in place pretty well. So this was a case where the, the track came out uh, pretty perfectly and we'll be able to use that without any issues. Uh, but if, for example, you tracked your scene and you tried to place a, uh, a null object into the scene and it was uh, really far away or had some strange values, um, while my values are centered, you could get a track where the um, After Effects places the tracker really far away and then you place an object into your scene and it looks uh, unusually small which means that the camera needs to be normalized. And there's actually a really great tutorial that I uh, always use whenever I need to fix a camera track. And it's a tutorial by Red Giant and it's all about uh, 3D normalization and After Effects of your camera. So if we just have a quick look at this, it's all about, shows you how to get a track and then a few simple steps to make sure that when you bring 3D objects into your scene that they uh, appear in the center to scale, which is going to be important with our um, particle simulations because we can't actually universally scale the simulation. So we need the camera to be at the right scale so that the spells are the correct size. So. We'll copy our plate, our camera, and that reference solid. And we'll go into the particles comp. And we'll just paste that in here. Make sure we place our custom camera uh, above the, the default camera. We can actually just delete it. Usually bring the footage in and use that as a reference. And as for this um, grid layer here, I'm going to position that upwards to try and figure out where in 3D space the wand uh, exists in. So, you could maybe push this back a little bit. Because we're going to attach our projectile and emission locator to uh, wherever we place that solid. So, we can just kind of estimate where it will be. It doesn't have to be too close because the because of the nature of the fluid animation spells, um, as long as it's approximately close, then it will work pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with that location, so the next thing to do will be to figure out when we want the particles to start being emitted. So by pressing U on the casting controls, we can see our keyframes for the emission rates here, so um, we've got emission rate for the impact and the projectile actually uses the emitter from speed so it doesn't actually need keyframes but in version 5 there is actually keyframes included for um, for the projectile as well as it's a slightly different emission model so if we select our keyframes here we can just uh, drag them across and we'll just scrub through our footage and just try and find the right frame where we're going to have our spell being emitted. I'll just make sure I uh, keep the timing of the light ray opacity there. And then we have our keyframes for the projectile locator. So I'm actually going to disable those keyframes, select our tracking layer that we made. And if we just copy the position and paste that into our spell projectile thing. Uh, now we'll have the, uh, and we'll do the same for the ring locator as well. So now we have both of them where the uh, actor's wand is going to be. And we can just position them to the correct location. And the great thing about this being a simulation is rather than just having an asset appear, we can actually have the asset follow the wand. So this is that um, expanding ring. So even while the ring is being emitted, it's kind of changing its location to follow the actor's wand. So we're now really creating a, a custom kind of simulation there that we wouldn't be able to do with assets. 
and we also just need to animate the actual spell projectile. We want to have that shooting off to the side of the screen. So I think if it just gets to the point where the spell is cast and then we have our projector projectile, we'll just um, experiment a little bit with the timing. Sometimes it's cool to have the projectile coming in slightly after the ring. Um, since he's flourishing the wand downwards, we could also kind of change the, the path as well. So rather than it coming out in a straight line, the projectile might kind of, you know, inherit some motion in a downward arc before it continues on its path, just to make it seem more intelligent. Uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll just have that uh, animate at that specific point. Because he does uh, quite an, an obvious uh, motion with the wand there, where you'd expect the projectile to start appearing. So we can now get a, an idea just using these null objects of what exactly is going to happen. And remember, we haven't actually looked at our particles yet. We're just using these uh, to do the animation. Because trust me, when we enable our particles, it's going to look uh, pretty decent no matter what we do so you don't need to constantly see the uh, the visual effects while you're setting up the animation but now that we've got to a point where we're ready to see if uh, this is uh, how this is going to look I'm going to do the same things where I just disable the motion blur reduce the particle count do the same again for the ring, uh, particles ring I'm not going to bother with the sparks as that's just like an extra effect uh, for the final render. Uh, but now that we've done that, uh, just so we can see it a little bit better in the video, because the sky is quite blown out, I'm just going to put some curves on the uh, footage there just to darken it down. Spells genu genuinely do look better in low light settings, because then you can exaggerate the, the lighting on the character. So if we start this, uh, so looks like our ring emission is coming in uh, too early. Uh, which is interesting because we did set the keyframes. So when something happens that you're not expecting, just we'll just confirm that the emission rate really is connected to that ring emission rate. So that's fine. It's not an issue with the expression. So that means it must be something to do with our casting controls. And I think I've just noticed that um, we forgot to set the first keyframe to zero. So we were emitting from the first frame. So if we just go put one keyframe zero, then it goes to the, uh, then it uh, starts spawning particles at the point that we want. You can also just clear some of the uh, cached memory just in case there's any uh, frames didn't immediately clear. And now we can actually uh, see this correctly. So there's our ring following the wand slightly. The, the ring currently has the full number of particles while the projectile doesn't, so that's why they look a little bit uneven. So this just takes a few seconds and looks like our ring is expanding a little bit larger than I'd like. And it's also lingering a little bit too long as well because I want the shield effect to happen directly afterwards. So once this is finished rendering, let's just have a look at it. So if it was just the spell, I'd be pretty happy with the length, but I actually want to um, force that ring to kind of disappear more quickly. So if we go to the casting controls, I'll just reduce the emission radius of the ring to 400 first. And uh, I can also come here to the ring particles lifespan and try setting that to something like 0 0.75. And then uh, see what difference those changes made. We'll give this another pre-render. So the ring's a bit smaller and it's disappearing slightly faster, but I'm, I'm going to be a bit more aggressive with those settings. Have the ring only expand to 300 uh, as opposed to 500. I'm going to make the ring particles even shorter so they, uh, they're only half the length. And we can also have them stop emitting slightly sooner because they continue emitting while the ring is expanding. But if I just drag these 
keyframes, they'll actually stop emitting sort of halfway through the, uh, the animation there. So now let's give this another look. And while this is caching in, we can get an idea of what this looks like. So let's see if those changes uh, made an improvement. So that's quite interesting. We have the uh, we have the ring kind of having this extra flourish right as he brings his wand round. So it almost feels like the ring is kind of uh, responding to the the new sort of swishing motion that he's doing with his wand, which a bit of a happy accident. That's the fluids kind of uh, expanding a bit aggressively at the end because of the velocity. Uh, but I'm not actually going to change that. I'm just going to keep that because um, I think it's. Uh, making it look more interesting. I'll reset all the, uh, you know, simply just enable motion blur, anything that we disabled, because we're going to actually do a full quality render now. So we're going to enable everything except for our footage. As you can see, it does have an alpha channel, so. And uh, so now we're just going to do a pre-render, so. I think the first thing I'll do, I'm just making sure everything is uh, ready to go. And then we'll set the resolution to full res, which I just like to do that before I, uh, before I begin a render, because I know I'm going to render it at full res. Uh, go to add to render queue there, and I like to render this as a quick time as a RGB plus alpha, so we have the alpha channel. And this is the perfect format for uh, rendering assets because they'll maintain all the quality and the alpha channel. So I'll just call this Expelliarmus. And I'll uh, begin this render and then uh, skip ahead and we'll see how long this took. So quite, uh, quite reasonable, only took six minutes to render. So I'm pretty pleased with that. Some of the larger spells do take longer, but you know, those are much more complicated effects, so we're actually getting a pretty um, pretty fast result. And now we can import that asset, and now when we go ahead to the export comp, I'm going to make sure I copy the uh, footage there. Go to the export comp, now we don't have to wait, uh, we don't have any delays when we're doing our compositing. So let's enable the footage so we can see our actor. You can see there's a some nice glows and some lighting being enabled. So if we come into the compositing options, we uh, we could reduce this glow radius a little bit. Maybe like 275. I'm going to reduce uh, this haze amount, which just kind of softens the effect, but uh, if we reduce that value, it'll actually make things look a bit sharper. And we also have these light directions so we've got the uh, if we enable this lighting layer you can see there's some lighting on the floor based on the color and animation and brightness of our spell we can actually adjust that distance from um, in 3d space so we can push that back and forth we can bring it left to right if you have the spell kind of moving over to one side of the screen we can have that lighting follow it and of course, as the spell is cast, it will follow the uh, projectile as well. We can also put some extra lighting on the character there, but that's something you could do in your own time within a, with an adjustment layer. So I'm just going to scrub through this. And you can see when the spell is finished, the lighting automatically fades away. So it's doing like 90% of the work for you there. So yeah, that's looking um, pretty decent. We've got some cool uh, displacement effects with the uh, embers as well, so it has that kind of interesting magical effect to it. You'll see that uh, cool kind of light ray that emits as the uh, ring explodes there. And with all the motion blur and the effects, uh, we have this really cool spell casting effect. So now that we've got that, I'm going to uh, bring in a new project, so I'm just going to clean up this workspace a little bit. And we're actually going to bring in the shield charm, and we're going to composite that into the same shot. So I'm going to go back into particular, I'm just importing a new project into the same space. So 
I'm going to import this Protego Deflection spell, which is more of a faster kind of swishing animation. So I'll click on that and go ahead and import that effect. And most of the spells are using the 32-bit uh, color space. Um, some of the, the other ones, like the debris or the smoke, only uses 16-bit. So um, always worth just having a quick look in the export comp. Just make sure that um, things are looking pretty sensible. So this shield looks as I imagined it to. So it's very bright for the first frame, and then it kind of becomes more uh, less opaque. And because we now have two comps called export comp and two comps called particles comp, I'm just going to put an S at the end for shield, just so we have some distinction between the projects uh, to prevent things from getting too confusing. And since we already have a camera track, we're just going to copy and paste our, our camera and our plate into the particles comp for the shield, which we'll just have to double click on this. I'm just closing any uh, extra comps that don't need to be open. It's all the same thing, it's simply a case of replacing the camera with our custom camera. Always using the footage just as a reference in the particles comp. And we also just need to, uh, we need the coordinates of the um, projectile locator, which is just those position keyframes. So I'm just going to copy that come to our casting locator for the shield and just paste the position uh, so now we have the shield appearing in the same location as well and so this shield is looking pretty large so and uh, before we change the size well, let's at least get it um, appearing at the right location so let's just solo the plate we get to the uh, the point where we see him doing the the second flourishing motion which looks more like a, he's deflecting downwards so we, we want the visual effect to kind of inherit that downwards motion so so to, to see a, a quick visualization uh, you've seen me go through this process a few times now so I'm gonna go through it a little bit more quickly it's all a case of just giving ourselves a, a proxy simulation so we'll position this into the right uh, location. Uh, we have this shield angle here, so we can decide what kind of rotation we want. So it is a, like an angled shot here, so we're going to just rotate that. So that's pretty handy. At the moment our shield is just like a static um, object in the scene but we can obviously take advantage of the velocity from motion by simply adding a few keyframes for the uh, movement that he does with the wand and this will actually make quite a big difference to how the the fluids and the physics of the shield end up forming the final version so this will make it look a little bit more chaotic by having this uh this little animation Again, so we're just really making the shield fit into not just the scene, but also like responding to the actor. And when we kind of enable everything, we have something that we just wouldn't be able to get with, you know, a 2D asset. We have not, not just a custom particle simulation, but it's responding to our actors in the scene. And so... Uh, the only thing, because it's so large, I kind of expect it to be occluded by the ground. So I've just uh, brought the grid layer that's included in the scene and moved it over to the same uh, place where our actor is. So now we can have, actually have the shield being occluded by the ground, uh, which is very cool. It's looking a little bit bright. And uh, so in order to just bring that down, we actually have this shield opacity which is the opacity of the particles themselves so by reducing that more particles will have to clump together to be uh, you know to create that kind of glowing effect so by reducing that we'll have a more transparent shield simply on other case that we have a you know a sky behind our actor which is usually quite blown out so 
we can just compensate. Uh, we can also reduce the size of the shield by reducing the particle velocity because the shield is kind of exploding outwards like a disc. So by bringing this down we'll get a more tighter kind of effect. It's quite a chaotic um, fluid effect that we're getting so which you'd imagine because it's you know repelling um, a, a spell, a fast moving projectile, so it's dispersing that energy. So I felt it was quite appropriate for the uh, the deflection shield to be quite chaotic. And uh, I'm just going to highlight just a few of the layers just so we can kind of work a bit more quickly. We actually have these directional speeds, which is kind of like a wind that pushes the particles in a direction after the impact. So by changing the left to right, forward and backwards, we can have the shield kind of move behind the actor and also blow over to the right hand side so it actually feels like you know the momentum and the velocity of that kind of powder is continuing in the same direction that the uh, the spell would have impacted from and so that's why it looks so visceral because you know the shield is uh, you know responding to a few different factors now um, I'm also enabling re-enabling that pixel motion blur which is an effect in the particles comp that will uh, make this look more a bit more softer and um, you can see it's kind of adding motion blur we didn't want to have that enabled with the footage but now that we're going to move over to the export comp and bring these effects all together we do want to have the extra effects so now we have two export comps we have the expelliarmus comp uh, which just uses the footage and then we also have our shield export comp which just has the shield. So we just need to decide which effect is gonna go on top of the other. So I think the shield will go behind the Expelliarmus. So uh, we can take a moment to admire the compositing displacement effects that are being added to the shield, it has the same lighting. And so I'm simply gonna go into the uh, original export comp that we added the spell. And instead of just using the footage, I'm actually gonna bring in our finished comp of the shield spell which is the export comp s so now if we bring that into the export comp we're now going to have two uh, projects being rendered in the same scene as well since we already pre-rendered expelliarmus that one's uh, pretty quick it's just the shield that has to render at full resolution so uh, but now that we, we have it all in place I'm going to set a quick time RGB from the add to render button and we're just going to give this a, a name I'm going to render out this shot or an uninspired name there spellcast and now what we'll do remember we're rendering the shield at full res so let's have a look that took about 12 minutes to render and composite everything together so we had six minutes for the Expelliarmus spell, 12 minutes for the shield spell, and we were able to work very quickly as long as we do those optimizations that we uh, we looked at. So now that we've imported this uh, render, we can actually have a proper look at what it all looks like when it comes together. So there we go, we have the casting spell, a very kind of visceral deflection kind of enhanced the kind of character's acting because it really looks like as he brought his spell down it made a very powerful sort of shield defense and you can see it has that kind of downwards motion which is great because you can have the shield being going from side to side and so these were um this was a quick look at some of the spells that are in trap code magic and as we go down here you can see we have stupefy which is the blue version of Flipendo with a shorter kind of trail. We have the Flipendo spell there, we have Expelliarmus which is the one we used and then we build our work our way up to a more powerful Incendio which is that multi-casting spell that McGonagall uses. There's our deflection, looks a little bit more uniform when it's just static. Uh, the Protego is similar to deflection but has this very thick kind of displacement plasticky effect which you know, equally looks as cool. Uh, we have the Protego Maxima, that very large shield that can rise up and cover like an entire street or it could all be like a personal shield. We have these one flash elements. I guess they're kind of similar to maybe 
muzzle flashes. You could create your own sort of flash for the wand, but if you have something that's really like a star-shaped, you know, flash for like a powerful spell, uh, that's a great one to use. Got the bombarder projectiles. It's kind of like your everything spell. You can change the color uh, from like blue to green to red and uh, have lots of them firing at the same time. So they're very rapid firing projectiles. And then the Bombarder Impact is a separate project, so you can decide when a spell impacts like a surface, like a wall or a floor, it will explode. We have the Avada Kedavra Lightning Spell, but you can change the colour to everything, uh, to anything that you want, so it can be uh, your typical blue lightning. We have the Death Eater Smoke, which turned out very, very satisfying, looks just like the, uh, the film there. We have the Expecto Patronum kind of shield that Harry first learns. This is a, a kind of smaller, more powdery kind of version. It's quite cool because you can rotate around that and, and get any kind of angle that you want. And then there's the more powerful Expe uh, Patronus Maxima that we see Dumbledore casting. Uh, and uh, then, of course, couldn't have a spell pack without the iconic um, dueling spell there. And so these are the film quality visual effects that you get in Trap Code Magic. Which has been a, uh, a great pack to work on and it's uh, even more of a pleasure to use it as long as you, uh, you know, respect the fact that we're trying to go for film quality visual effects. So you have to um, optimize your workflow a little bit to get the best results. But um, the end results are always worth the time investment. Okay, so thanks for watching this tutorial and stay tuned for next time where we'll be having a look at some of the other spells that are included in Trapcode Magic.